This is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business. Today, you're going to have an opportunity to hear from Donna Blevins, who I first met in the back of a room in Atlanta when we were both attending a conference. And what struck me was this tall woman who was rolling a hula hoop around her hips. And I remembered hula hoops from when I was a kid, and I was never really good at it, but she was in entertaining the crowd with the swiveling hips and her hula hoop. So Donna has multiple talents, including being a hula hoop player, being a person who's knowledgeable about playing poker and about mind shift and the ways that we influence our behavior. Donna, welcome to the show. Pat, I am absolutely honored to be here. And I was just so surprised when you had told me that you remember way back when that hula hoop and it was an athletic hula hoop that they actually have designed them and thank you so much because it's in the living room i will get back into the habit because it's good for the core absolutely it's good for the core (laughs) well what i'd like to ask you about in our talk today is for you to describe the process that you've achieved in order to complete your first book and let's start with What is your book about and why did you write it? The book is about mind shifting. It's how to really get in contact with that magnificent biological supercomputer that you come fully equipped with. We have an amazing ability of our brain, but generally we are unaware of what we can do with it. And the process involves actually, I call them code modifiers that you can download to your subconscious mind to reprogram your subconscious because that's our driver. And the whole process of mind shifting has to do with rather than being the unwitting passenger in your life, be the active conscious driver. It sounds like you subscribe to the school of um being able to determine your fate and being in control of your life. I would certainly prefer to have it as my design. And there are lots of things out there that we have no control over. However, we have control over our reality, how we perceive what's going on, how it can even turn a terrible situation into even more than a tolerable situation. And it's how we frame it, how we look at it. Our life is created by the way we perceive, by our perception. And that's all mindset work. And give our viewer who's watching this on our YouTube channel or listening to us on our audio channels, give that person a sense of your background. Who were you before you wrote this book? Well, who was I? I am six feet, five inches tall, and that has led me to a lot of different situations because I was put, let's see, I was gifted to have this body because I stood out and it was difficult to hide. And I was an athlete in high school, not because I chose to be. But it was almost like I was almost like I was shamed to be because I had grown so fast in in grade school. In fifth grade, I grew nine inches. And that's very painful. And going into the sixth grade, I was already taller than everybody else. And and it's it's what's funny about it is that the only thing to take off the the growing pains was to put me in elevated shoes. (laughs) So the whole process of of my physicality has taken me into a lot of different industries. And I've been a marketing consultant. I was in real, commercial real estate for 20 years, had my own real estate company. I was the management broker for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And the reason my physicality had a lot to do with it because it was in, in professions that most often were male-dominated. And because of my, the gift of my height, it gave me the strength and the confidence now, mind you, it didn't come with the confidence. It didn't come with the self-esteem. I had to learn it and how to develop it. And it, it even modeling, it'd say, oh, you're so tall, you should model. 
And then I'd go look for modeling and they'd go, I'm sorry, you're too tall. <laughs> so <laughs> in those days, I actually became a convention host because let's face it, if you're going to invest in a vendor table at a convention, you know, what, what's the main thing you want to happen at that table? You want traffic. You want people to come and visit you. That's exactly right. So I was a commodity that they hired because let's face it, I was, who's going to stop at what table? I mean, I was in hot pants and hooker boots and with my, it was like six, nine and I was jovial and fun and people would stop. So what I learned from that, I learned about communication and interaction. I learned to read people. I learned to determine when somebody's walking up to me, I could tell you what style they were going, what their personality style. Eventually, I became a Performax certified consultant, and Performax was the original company that created the DISC system, the DISC, the four quadrants of behavior, that is the foundation of our psychology today, Carl Jung's four quadrants of behavior. And I loved that, and that became something I used in sales. And you're asking for the threads, and I'm thinking about it, and that then morphed into the poker became a natural sequence. It might seem a little odd, but it was because I was strong in sales. I could read people. Poker is, yes, a card game played by people, but it's most importantly a people game played with cards. And what I determined that I could use that skill that I had developed in reading people to help me excel at poker without ever understanding the abstract math side of poker as much as the people side. I served as a ghostwriter for a man for two of his books. He's a body language specialist and he was a, a master poker player and was quite well known in several casinos until the casinos began recognizing him and encouraging him not to walk in their door and maybe move along to another casino that might have been further out down the block. Well, now, was he a, for them to do that, it would probably be that he was playing blackjack rather than poker, because they wouldn't ask him to go down the block if he were a really good poker player. But if he was in blackjack, that meant that he was beating them because he knew how to read the cards. Is that uh, correct? He was probably blackjack more than poker. I think so. Yeah. And, and that's the whole concept of it. So he was, um, he was escorted out of casinos because of that, but poker, it's interesting because in poker, you play against other people. The house gets a little bit of like rent. They take a little bit of money out of each pot and it's like the rent you pay for your table and for the room and, and for the dealers. So the whole process of poker has been life changing for me. Because in 1996, poker saved my life. And you're going to tell us about that, correct? <laughs> well, I was just going to ask you, I was going to say, okay, is that an interesting thing she wants to hear about? <laughs> <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, I was brand new to the poker table. And when I say brand new, I mean, I was brand new. I was in my late forties. We owned a real estate company, as I mentioned before, and I was the management broker for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And it was a highly oh, stressful situation because when I took custody of that division, it was five counties in southwest Florida, I took custody of 257 properties in one day. And by the time it was, not, it was in the early 90s and by the time 1996, I was overwhelmed. And this is one of the things that I want everyone who hears my voice or sees my face know that we get so involved with everything that we're doing, we forget self-care and we ignore taking care and putting ourselves first. It's so critical. So I'm in this hand and it would only if a little while after I started playing and I'm in the hand, literally I have cards in front of me and I start thinking about 
oh, this contractor I had to deal with today, man, he's just so difficult to work with. And he didn't do that job right. And he's got to go fix that. I, I've got to get a hold of it. And I've got, oh, tomorrow I've got, uh, you know, I've got specifications to send out tomorrow for a roof and then for uh, a flooring. And because the properties had to be brought up to federal habitability standards in order to be able to for the government to resell homes that they had acquired because of the foreclosure process. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about all this stuff. And it was as if the poker gods tapped me on the forehead and I heard a voice in my head. And it was, there's only one thing that exists. And that's the cards that you have. Past cards are always folded. Future cards are never here. And in that moment, I went to that place of mindfulness, and it was as if it was almost like it was, it was like all my energy came back to my body and everything else around me just disappeared. The only thing that existed was that table. The only thing that existed is the hand that I'm in. And I went to that po point, a point of mindfulness, and I believe that with 100% confidence that because of poker, I am here with you today. If it hadn't been for poker, I believe I would have died from stress or a heart attack. So it saved my life. Mm. I know in talking with you earlier in preparation for the show, you mentioned that you were involved in, it sounds like many industries, poker, construction. You were also involved in publishing publishing print magazines. How did that experience involved with publishing print magazines influence your book when you decided to write your book? Having experience in writing has affected my life forever. When you were talking about this book, my first book, book was actually in the 80s. In the year before the internet, and it, it's interesting because there's a part of me that wants to go find it and publish it in today because it had to do with real estate. It was called Home Prescription, Today's Sure Cure for Selling Homes Fast. I mean, what could be better than that now? It's like it's time to find the manuscript for that book and republish it. But the publishing, because of the print magazines, I was vice president of advertising and some vice president of marketing for others, but I always had a column. So I became writing. I have published over a thousand articles and doing that gets you into the point of writing. And I would, every time I'd write an article and in those days, the articles had to be a thousand words. And the intention was what one thing do I want people to get co away with to get from this article that helped me in my writing so that concept of doing that helped me get out right easier and the, everything led to writing and, and it's interesting because since i was in the teens i was actually involved in publishing because mother would say i need to get this news newsletter out for one of her organizations can you help me get it printed so i guess i was in publishing back in the teens so the publishing goes throughout the whole process. And when I started looking for a publisher 10 years ago, it's like, I want to be published out in the big world today. And you have to have a different market to be able, you have to be a different person and have a different platform. Celebrities, you really have to have a big calling, something that's really notable, you know, go one win eight olympic medals and then you can write a book so it's the process taught me just to write it and after you know it's, it's like and interestingly enough chicken soup for the soul they had like 250 no's before they finally got a yes i didn't i didn't match his but i sure got a lot of a lot of them and then i decided when my poker coaching clients when i would say just shift your mindset and they'd go, how do we do that? And I would go through a process and they'd finally say, would you just write it down? So that whole process led me to that. Isn't that great? Listen to what your market is telling you. Just write it down, Nancy. Just write it down. 
That's it. That's it. It's just, it's really important to write it down. That's one of the things that I want anyone listening. If you think that, that you have something that you want to write, listen, write it. It's a lot better getting out there messy than not at all. Get it out there first time. I don't care if, if, if all you get is, you know, you get this book and it's like 72 mistakes in it. Excellent. You got some place to start. But if it stays in your magnificent biological supercomputer, who else is going to see it? You need to get it out there. So I understand, Donna, that you worked with a book coach to help you get through this process. Can you tell us what that collaboration was like? I actually took a course in writing a book and I I loved her course. She was, (laughs) she's what I call a hybrid. She's very pragmatic, but she's also got a pretty highly uh, toned woo-woo side. (laughs) <laughs> besides being logical, I mean, literally, she was a Microsoft, um, she, she wrote Microsoft code. So she, her left brain was truly active, but she's also a Simply Heal practitioner, which mm-hmm. is in the spiritual side. And when I first got on there, she would do some of her woo-woo stuff and I'd go, oh, and then all of a sudden I went, oh, so I said, okay, there's, there's something to this. And she was the one after I had, I, my book was ready to publish in 2013. And she was the one that made a suggestion after I thought it was ready because on Halloween, 2013, I, I'm in, this is my, my office. This is my studio. And I have, I had three screens at the time and I had my, my desktop and then two other screens up here. And I, I had this huge screen and I had one of the mind shift exercises was up on the screen and I was looking at it and I stood up from my computer right here and I put my hip, the hands on my hips, you know how you do that and you're going, "Mm." and I looked at that and I said, I want something to prove my mind shift exercises work and I want proof now. And I'm going to cancel that because I'm not requesting that because be careful what you ask for. Moments later, I had a massive center left brain stroke. And when I hit the floor, I thought, be careful what you ask for. Hmm. And I was unable to speak except for two words. And that was Donna and crap. (laughs) And fortunately, I was airlifted to the Florida teaching hospital. And all along the way, the healthcare team is saying she will never be able to speak fluidly again it'll take her eight to nine months before she can talk and i chose to detach and observe and be the witness rather than buying into that disease which is what my mind shifting exercises are about it's about detaching and observing rather than being it believing it becoming it and it's something that is counterintuitive for you it's not healthy for you And the great news is doing my mind shifting exercises, I was able to speak fluidly in three days. And I know that there are healthcare professionals who will listen to this, who will say, that's an amazing story. And there are non-healthcare professionals who will also say that's an amazing story. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen anyone make that kind of recovery. And I've taken care of a lot of people as a nurse who've had strokes. Well, the wonderful thing is five weeks after I had the stroke, I had a heart procedure because when your heart is out of rhythm, I had AFib, which Mm -hmm. triggered atrial fibrillation when the top part of the heart is quivering. And that people who have that are five times more probable to have a stroke, especially if they're not on blood thinners, which I wasn't because I was so healthy. They said, there's no reason to do that. And it was interesting because five weeks after I had a heart procedure to help to rectify that. And the day before the heart procedure, they took me in for a heart cath when they took a look at my heart to be sure I was okay for the surgery. And 
it was interesting because it was very early in the morning and they didn't have a room for me in the hospital yet. And so they said, well, you'll have to wait in recovery. And that's fine. I didn't care where I was. I mean, I was on cloud nine. It was so wonderful. I felt so good having this done. And I would have people come over to me and they'd say, I heard you're a poker coach. What, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a poker mindset coach. And it has to do with shifting your mindset. And they would, they would come over and they go, well, tell me about that. So I actually started teaching the nurses and the support staff in, in, the, in the cath lab a mind shift exercise called the egg, which it's one of the chapters in the book. And it's an amazing way to insulate yourself from the negativity that's around you. And they would come over kind of blue. And when they left, they would feel better. Their body language was different. And I helped 13 people during eight hours because I mean, I'm going, I'm on duty. That was a wonderful place to be. And at five o'clock, the doctor came in who had done the heart cath and she came up to me and she almost had a frown on her face and she put her hand on my forearm and she said, what have you been teaching my people? And I went, I've been teaching them the egg. And she said, teach me. And I just got chills because it was so amazing. I walked her through the process. It takes about four minutes to do. And she said, you have to, you have to go talk to the CEO of, of the hospital because healthcare teams need this because we have so much on our plate and there's so much negative people, people come in sick. They bring in the negative energy with them. You know, when you see somebody come in, they have this dark cloud following them and there's a way that you can insulate yourself from it. So that was a gift that I got because of my, my stroke and because of my heart procedure. Well, that was, it sounds like that was not your first book, the mindset book was your second book? Well, actually, it was my second published book, but I had had all the small, all the articles along the way. So it's my second published book, but okay. the other one was in the 80s. So, you know, it exists, but this was the first one that was actually launched out publicly like this one is. The other book was actually in the end, of, in the time of day during the no money down era yes. of real estate. Yes. And I was a, a speaker who was, remember I said that one of the things about my physicality gave me the benefit of competing in a male industry. And mm -hmm. I was asked to be one of those speakers. And it was, it was, I was the only woman who <laughs> survived to thrive in that industry. And I had to publish a book and a course. And that was the first book and it had recordings that went with it. And so it's interesting because that was, uh, I guess, course creation is something that is the foundation of what I do as well. And tell us about the additional books that are in your head. And I know that there's got to be more. What's ahead for you in terms of publishing books? Well, well thank you, because the the whole process of having a book that, you know, a, a book that's, you know, the regular size book. And by the way, you see these little tabs on the book. I read the book every day. You know, if I'm going, it, it's like, it's wonderful to be able to read a book and to be the reader than the writer and to look at it from a different standpoint. I'll pick a number and go to that page and read it. And it's, it's, you know, it becomes my, my daily kind of substitute Bible. Mm -hmm. it, so what I've done is I've realized that we as a human, as human beings, our DNA has been changed by the internet and by smartphones because we want it. We want it now and we want something fast. So what I'm in the process of doing, there's 12 mind shift exercises in the book. I'm going to teach, eat, take each one of them and turn them into a, a pocketbook, a four by six small pocketbook under a hundred pages and it's going to be one that you can you know carry with you and 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 think oh i really like that one so that you can have a collection of these because i believe today we're all about sampling about tasting so it's, i'm, I'm going to create a smorgasbord the buffet for people to look at the mind shifting work and i have other um, book series that are also in work. So one of them has to do with course creation, because I have been told by my coaching clients over the years that I am the chief simplifier. 
because mm-hmm. I like to boil things down to its simplest because complexity is confusing to me and I have to figure it out. And that's the way that I had started teaching people poker is because they go, Hey, how did you get where you are? And I said, well, let's see if I can explain that. How do I explain the people part of it? And uh, as a matter of fact, in a, a, a 90 minutes today, I'm getting on a key, keystone session with a, one of my, with a new poker coaching client. She was actually my first poker coaching client 12 years ago, but she resurfaced this week and said, look, I'm competing in a tournament this weekend. And I'd really like for you to be my poker coach during that because it's been so long since I've been at the table. So that that's a blessing for something to come back and saying, hey, you did really good then. Can you do it again? Mm-hmm. So I'm doing a key, I call it a keystone session, which is the session to set a foundation for working with someone. Yes. Before we continue with the show, I'd like to share this special announcement with you. As a frustrated author, if you feel stuck on how to start or finish your book, then this message is just for you. When you're blocked and questioning if the effort is worthwhile, you're facing writing obstacles, you're not knowing how to proceed, you feel like you're walking through mud. And you need to realize there's a cost to being stalled. You're not reaping the benefits of being a published author and your book is sitting inside you aching to get out. You feel like you're being diverted to other projects and priorities. And without steadily writing, your unfinished manuscript makes you feel anxious and frustrated. If you ignore the project, you just feel worse. What most writers do when faced with the idea of writing a book is to hope for inspiration that one day you'll wake up and know how to proceed. But for most people, that doesn't happen. You don't have the inspiration to move forward and you don't know how to conquer writing obstacles. You lose the focus of why you should go through this effort. And what happens if you just do nothing? If you just keep doing what you've been doing? You become one of the 81% of Americans who think they have a book in them and never get the pleasure of finishing it. You think, I wish I had a process to get this manuscript finished. It seems so difficult. You keep wondering, I'd like to know a way that I could get this project done. I've got an answer that works for getting your manuscript started and finished. Through writing or editing 49 of my own books, I learned the strategies that enabled me to accomplish my writing goals. I learned how to get my book written in the most efficient and effective way and to appreciate the phenomenal rewards that come with being an author. These techniques work for me, and they'll work for you. My system allowed me to accomplish my prolific writing career. When my book coaching clients call me to share their own frustrations with writing, I take them through the process I will reveal to you and arm them with the tools to get their books done. Would you love quick reminders and tips to get your book done? When you order the tips for writing a powerful book, you will receive my card deck and you'll get the keys to overcoming writer's block, managing your motivations to keep on track, discovering bite-sized tips from an experienced author on how to write your book. It all comes as part of the tips for writing a powerful book. How to get started. This card deck gives you 48 cards with gorgeous images, nine tips on focusing your book, nine tips on smoothing the writing process, nine inspirational messages if you get stuck with a writing block, nine benefits of publishing a book to help you concentrate on the goals of getting your book done, and nine tips to stay on track by conquering writing obstacles. It's decision time. You have a choice to make. Do what you've been doing, or worse, do nothing at all. Or you know where that will lead to. Is that really where you want to stay? Stuck and overwhelmed and not getting your book done? Or you can arm yourself with a resource to keep you focused, motivated, and confidently making progress on your book. What do you really want 
for yourself, a sense of accomplishment or frustration. Here's what to do now. Go to mywriting.tips forward slash powerful book. That's all one word. Mywriting.tips forward slash powerful book and click on the button to place your order. You'll receive the card deck in the mail. You'll love it. That link again is mywriting.tips forward slash powerful book. Now let's return to the show. And then we talked a little bit beforehand, and I'd like you to share with our audience in the remaining few minutes, the concept of matching a card deck with a book or a series of books. Can you tell me what your plans are along those lines? Absolutely, because one of the things I want anyone who's thinking about writing a book or who has a book is that when you take your concept and you really have it fleshed out, repurpose it and repurpose it again because people are different consumers. People like things in their hands, you know, like, and by the way, I actually bought my book on uh, my Kindle book as well. I bought it on Amazon. <laughs> I wanted it to go in my Kindle library. It's kind of funny. I go there and says, you bought that book. And I went, okay, fine. So it's, it's the ability to repurpose. Card decks are phenomenal because people like cards. And it's like, it, someday I feel like a cards and I pull out, I've got uh, dozens of card decks of people that, that have to do with thought processes, mindfulness, uh, Wayne Dyer. I have all of his card decks, anything that was published through Hay House. I really like those because they had a bunch, they had a sale one year for five bucks a deck. <laughs> and I said, give me all of those because I use them as gifts. So I think having your, your book turned into a card deck is profound. And I want you to understand, it's not a case of writing a lot of stuff on a card. It's about taking something that is a thought, a simple thought, that, that will be able to stimulate someone to do a thought. Some people make card decks that are bullet points, that, that, that bullet journals. When somebody said, okay, journal about this, some people do that. So it can be used in many different ways. The possibilities are endless, Pat. I think that we could go on for several more hours, Donna, but we won't. <laughs> You've given us lots to think about, inspiring stories, stories about experiencing a stroke and getting a return of your voice within days, which is probably almost totally unheard of. Using the power of your mind, using the lessons that you have learned, influencing other people, teaching people. You are clearly a natural teacher who wants to share and help other people improve their lives with the techniques that you have learned. How can our listener or our viewer get more information about you, your book, and your services? The very simple way is to go to mindshiftondemand.com. That's mindshiftondemand.com. And right now you can opt in for a four minute audio, which is my signature mind shift exercise. Hmm, isn't that interesting? One of the reasons I have it simplified, you know, you go to people's sites sometimes and there's all these tabs and you're going, where do I go? It is a simple page. And I have other things that I provide that are also simple pages, but I think it's easy to keep it simple. Just go to that page, opt in for that that and then you'll be on my list I'll let you know if you are a Facebook user by the way at 65 I'm known as the big girl of poker it's facebook.com forward slash big girl poker on YouTube my uh, it's it's big girl poker on Twitter it's big girl poker on Clubhouse it's big girl poker on Instagram it's big girl poker so if you wonder about that just look for big girl poker and you'll find me all right. Thank you, Donna. I appreciate you sharing your time and your insights with our audience today. I'm honored, Pat, to be here. I'm here to serve. And thank you to you who's been listening to this program. Please be sure to add a comment on YouTube below this video. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a thumbs down. Give us a comment. And tell a couple of people in your life 
who are interested in writing nonfiction books or have written nonfiction business books and are looking for inspiration and tips and amazing interviews with people about this channel, Writing to Get Business. Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Writing to Get Business, and I have just finished interviewing Felicia Slatterly, who is a multi-book author, all different types of books and different formats. Can you give our listener a little sense of what we covered in your podcast, Felicia? Oh my gosh. We talked about how I got publishing deals and how each one of my eight books came about. We talked about how I got two of the books done in less than a week. We talked about how I have been able to monetize my books, each and every one of them that I have wanted to monetize. We have talked about what publishers are looking for if you want to work with a publisher. And we covered just so much ground. You've got to listen. And also, um, we shared some recipes and food tips, too, just for fun. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, so be sure to catch Felicia Slatterly's podcast as she talks about her journey from her first book, which is no longer in print, to the books that are still in her head and the one that will be coming out soon, also not yet in print, but will be shortly. Thanks so much.